behind me in Colossians chapter 1. As well, uh, there are Bibles in the seat back pocket in front of you. Colossians chapter 1. I was amazed last week as I hear the pages turning. Um, We rolled out to you our Coast Hills app. And I just want to bless the Lord for your response last week. Um, We did not see a major dip in our tithing record last week. That's to commend your faithfulness. And so our desire is to make this announcement over the course of February, but commend you as I see your response as we desire to minister to the community, especially those that come for the first time, that we might give unto them uh, and bless them. So Colossians chapter one, would you read uh, along with me as I read out loud? And so from the day we heard, Paul says, We've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? What an incredible prayer the Apostle Paul prayed for the church, filled with knowledge, fully pleasing to Jesus. And you qualified us by the blood of your Son, to share in an eternal inheritance. What manner of life ought we to live to thank you? Surely not just a Sunday experience, but every day I pray this prayer over our body that we would be fully pleasing to you each and every day, each and every moment of our life. Thank you for Coast Hills. Thank you for everyone that's here, Lord. And I pray your blessing upon them with this prayer. And now as we go into your word, would you give us spiritual ears? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you have your seat? Today we are part two of a two-part series called Family Life. Last week, installing our elders, the role of an elder. This week, our sermon entitled, The Role of the church, the role of the church. This word first mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. Peter makes an incredible proclamation of faith there in Matthew chapter 16. And if you have your Bible, would you turn to Acts chapter 2 to prepare for our Bible study? Well, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 16, as you're turning to Acts chapter 2, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds with that incredible statement of faith, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen again to what Jesus said. Upon this rock, on that statement of faith that you mentioned, Peter, that I am the Christ, it is from there that my church will grow. And he said this, I will build my church. Now, I want to break that down just for a moment. He says, I will build. This is his responsibility. It's not Chet's responsibility. It's not your responsibility for this church to be built and established. The responsibility was laid on Jesus. He took it with a whole heart. He died on the cross, and he rose again on the third day. It was his responsibility to cause the church to come into formation, and it's his responsibility to build the church. That's why when you leave this sanctuary, I don't leave with you. The elders of this church don't leave with you. The leaders of this church don't leave with you. But Jesus takes the word of God and builds it up in you so that he can do the work of building his church. He said, I will build, listen again, my church, my church. 
It's not Chet's church. It's not Coast Hills church. It's not your church. It's Jesus' church. My church, he says, and the pronoun that he uses describes the fact that he's going to build it his way. We can't go to God and say this is what we think church is. We can't allow our culture to dictate what God thinks church is. God has showed us what church is, and our response is to do it his way because it's his church. Now, based on this truth, Paul writes an entire letter to 1 Timothy. And for homework this weekend, or this week, I encourage you, read through the entire letter that Paul wrote this young pastor in 1 Timothy. But I want to pull out a piece of it. It's there. You can write it in your notes, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Once again, you can write it in your notes, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He says, I'm writing you this letter so that you might know how to conduct yourself in the house of the living God, the church, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. Hey, Timothy, I'm writing you because I want you to know how to behave in church. I'm writing to you so that you'll know how to conduct yourselves in church. If God wants to do it his way, then we better do it his way so that he alone will be glorified. But I'm writing to you about the church. Because the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. It holds to the truth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Paul would further say that I've determined not to know anything else among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He is the rock that this church is built on. He is the pillar that this church will build upon. And everything in the Roman world were built with pillars on rocks and all of the structures were held together by these pillars that were on these rocks so every Roman person knew exactly what Paul was talking about about Jesus is that rock and it's by him and it's through him and it's for him that this church exists. Well, the Holy Spirit does a wonderful job of giving us several churches in the New Testament to learn from of what to do and some things of what not to do. I mean, if you want to learn what not to do, just read First and Second Corinthians. You will learn everything of what you're not supposed to do in church. And God takes the time through the Holy Spirit to use the church of Corinth to say, hey, don't do this, don't do this. I can't believe you're doing this. Maybe you shouldn't do this. But he also uses some churches to show us what to do. There's no greater church for us to look like, look like or to look at than the first church in Jerusalem. This church was known for great power, the Bible says in Acts 4. It was known for great grace in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 5, it's known for great fear. The three greats of any church, great power, great grace, and great fear. So I want us to take a look at this church. I've asked you to turn there. It's Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'll be reading from verse 42. Acts chapter 2, I'll be reading once again from verse 42. Would you look with me there? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. There are seven dynamic principles about this dynamic church. Great power this church existed in. And they're going to go on the screen behind me. We're going to talk about them briefly. Listen, number one, they had their spiritual priorities in place. I love the Olympics. It's amazing that once you put your mind to something and you put your priorities in place, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you know what your priorities are. Think of Lindsey Vaughn. Out of the Olympics in 2014, now a champion in 2018. Out because of injuries, but she made a gold medal her priority. She made it getting back into the Olympics as a priority of her life. And she did everything she could by putting disciplines in her life, from the way she ate, to the way she worked out, to the way she rehabbed. Everything was built around her priorities because the truth is, if you put disciplines disciplines in your life, you can accomplish any goal that you set your mind to. And so the disciplines of the church, they committed themselves to the Word of God. 
They committed themselves to fellowship. They committed themselves to prayer. They committed themselves to communion. Things that this church says we want to have our spiritual priorities put into place. But I want you to see something else in verse 43. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Number two, if you'll see on the screen, they were exercising their gifts. The apostles had these supernatural gifts that they were walking in and they were acting in, but they weren't the only ones exercising their gifts. Stephen, he was a deacon. He was exercising his gift of service. James, the apostle, he was exercising his gift of administration. And everyone in the church were using the gifts that God had given them to edify, to build up, and to equip the church for the work of the ministry. Blake, he is edifying and equipping the church. Those that are shut in, those that are sick, those that can't be here, Blake is giving of his gifts that God has given him so that he might be able to edify the church and equip the church through our technology. How are you exercising your gifts? You see, exercising gifts is part of a dynamic church, so much so that Paul has to write Timothy because Timothy, was he was a little bit um, afraid of exercising his gifts. And I don't know if um, I can use my gift, and I love what Blake says. You just know it, and you do it. And so Paul writes Timothy, and he says, Timothy, fan the flame of your gift. God has not given you a spirit of fear, he says in 2 Timothy. Exercise your gift. Number three, if you take a look with me, it's Acts chapter two. I'm gonna go to verse 44. And all who believed were together and they had all things in common. This dynamic church was unified in heart and in mind. In mind, they all believed. They all had the foundation of Jesus Christ, just like this church, but they had heart. They weren't serving, they weren't volunteering because they had to. No, they were sharing with one another because they wanted to. In Nehemiah, The Bible talks about a group of people that left Babylon and they went back to Israel. And Nehemiah was given the chance to rebuild the wall. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, he writes of an impossible task to rebuild this wall. It was impossible with the people that were given to him. He said, so we built the wall to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. He did the impossible because they were unified. If you take a look with me going on in Scripture, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This church was generous. You see, in the Old Testament, tithing was mandatory. Malachi says this. He says, listen, try me in this. God is speaking to the the believers, and he says, would you test me? See if I don't bless you in return for the way that you give. But tithing was mandatory. It was required of the Jew to give. The New Testament? The New Testament uses a new word, generosity. The New Testament gives it a grace-filled word, not a responsibility. No, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that this was not a measure of tithe. This was an attitude of grace. He says, I pray that this grace you will abound more and more. It's our initiative, isn't it? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And our prayer is that we will be able, through your change, to be able to affect the lives of refugees in, that have come out of Iran and are living in Turkey as we want to minister to believers that are struggling and suffering. And so we've asked you to put your change in these little buckets with the sticker on it so that we can bless. And our prayer has been $20,000 so that we can, in turn, bless these kids that are over there. But it's not just what's over there. It's pouring into Blake's. It's allowing this building to function. It's the generosity of the saints. Let me tell you, we just hosted an event here with Mike Singletary. How many of you were here? How many of you were here? Amen. That was the generosity of believers who paid for the food, who paid for Mike to come, who did all of the everything. It was from the generosity. They saw a need and met the need. They weren't waiting for someone to say help. This church dynamic, look at the next verse. And day by day, 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and, gen, uh, and generous hearts. Number five, consistent fellowship. They went to church five times a day, every day. Oh my, how we have come from that nationally. The national average is not day by day, five times a day, go to church. The national average is that the normal Christian goes to church 1.7 times a month. Dynamic church, consistent fellowship. Listen to Scripture in Hebrews. Don't neglect gathering yourselves together as some will become, as some will follow the habit of doing. No, we want to be a dynamic church with consistent fellowship because the word church, ecclesia, Jesus borrowed from a, 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 a governmental secular society this word. It means ecclesia. It simply means a direction, church, a gathering of people. The very title that Jesus gives it is a direction for us. It's a gathering and assembly of people when we gather together on the Lord's day, the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead on Sunday, and we celebrate that event every single day. Number six, praising God and having favor with all the people. It's a lifestyle. They weren't just in church praising God. They were amongst the people. They were teachers at schools. They were bankers, mortgage brokers, and lawyers. These were Jews. Most of them were lawyers. And they were just out in their world doing their thing, praising God. You see, they had developed a lifestyle of worship. They didn't come to be entertained. They didn't come to, you know, no, they came to learn how to live a life of worship. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that our bodies, our very lives, are a living sacrifice. We're to give every aspect of who we are to Jesus if he's our foundation and our rock. Number seven, if you take a look real quickly, the last verse, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They had a testimony. They had a testimony of favor. The world saw their love in action, and the world said, I want to be a part of that. So dynamic, so overwhelming. I don't know what kind of club is going on over there, but I want to make sure that I'm there. Do you know we had over 40 young adults here on Thursday night? Over 40 young adults here on Thursday night. And you know what they were doing? I looked around the room as I'm leading this ministry, and I am watching these young kids worship with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. What a testimony that I'm able to report of over 40 kids who take their 30 Thursday night. They don't study. They're not going to work. They've made it a priority to say, I want to worship Jesus, and I want to learn about him. What a testimony. I've asked myself, what's our testimony? Well, the church in Rome, their testimony was, your faith is proclaimed around the world. The church in Philippi, you've partnered with me in the gospel. The church at Thessaloniki, oh, you turn there with me. It's a surprise verse, okay? I just want to see if you know where your Bibles are. First Thessalonians, go with, it, with me to chapter 1. little surprise verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want you to see their testimony. Power. Look with me, verse 1. I mean, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering for our God and Father, listen to their testimony, your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer for our church. Would you please welcome with me to the stage uh, one of our elders, Doug and Melissa Armstrong, and my wife, Andrea. <laughs> Melissa's actually going to sing a solo today. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> She's a little concerned her couch is smaller than our couch. Uh, but uh, hey, it, I think one of the greatest joys that I've had, you know what, I'm going to put this pulpit down um, so everyone can see your incredible faces. There we go. Is that better? Um, it was such a joy. We had uh, breakfast on Saturday morning, um, and uh, it was just so great to get together with you guys. And um, Doug, uh, when I, can I tell the story of when I first met you guys, please? Yes, sure. Okay. So I'm at Starbucks, and I'm waiting for Doug to do the elder interview, you know, and Melissa. Now, Melissa's a force of nature. Um, she's just, she doesn't know a stranger. She's just, you need to get to know her. Um, she sits down, there's a hello, and then she says, I just got to know, are you the real deal or not? We need a real deal pastor. <laughs> we had the best, she was immediately a best friend. I'm asking her to disciple all my three girls, um, especially my one daughter, Selah. And uh, we uh, are just so thankful for you guys and so grateful, Doug, um, just for your leadership. Doug, you, you, you guys have been an elder here for 12 years. You've been a part of the church for 30. Um, what was the process like on your end? I mean, me coming here and you, your leadership over the last 12 years. Well, you had really kind things to say about my wife. And, and about, but what you said about me is that, uh, boy, he sure lawyered me. <laughs> so we, no, we've had a, a great leadership. And yes, we have been blessed as a team to serve as an elder for almost 12 years. But more importantly, we have been part of this body for nearly 30 years. Um, and that has been an incredible blessing um, to us. Your life group's been together for how many years? About almost 30 years, too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, Melissa, you wanted the full 45 minutes. Um, so I'm still mad I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Um, you've, you've been the elder's wife, and you've walked through so many things, been so supportive. Um, what's the one thing as, you know, one of the leaders here at this church um, that God has really shown you over the last 12 years in this role for this church? I think the word that comes to mind is just faith. You know, that truly our king is living in this church, and this church is his bride. And wh wh whoever comes or goes, whatever happens, he will be faithful. Amen. He will be faithful. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, we want to know what it means to have this kind of testimony in our church. Um, the Thessalonians were known for works of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope. And that's our prayer, that when Coast Hills is mentioned, that we have a testimony. Um, Doug, what, is, what does it mean to, to have works of faith? You know, I'll be happy to respond to that, but like any lawyer, I'm going to say something first. Perfect. Thanks, like that. Um, the reason we're sitting up here in this kind of arrangement, other than it's really comfortable, is because I know that both of us, in, in how we have had our families, is that at the dining room table is where we make sure that that's sacrosanct. Mm. There's no television on, no phones allowed. Everybody has an equal voice. That's where we do business of our family. That's where we talk about the joys, we talk about the fears, we talk about the troubles and concerns. So really what we're doing here is inviting all of you into our dining room table so that we as a family can talk about something that's so important and encourage all of us as a family. Yeah, it's so good. We were gonna host a quarterly meeting and we thought, <clears throat> let's just do a family meeting at church. We were talking about the role of an elder and last week's service, um, it was, I mean, all glory to Jesus. What, I was up here looking at all of you pray for our newly installed elders and it was just, it was a glorious sight to see. And this week, the role of the church and we're a family, we're a family. So what does it mean to, be a family that is known for works of faith. You know, when I, st I, when I first looked at that, and I thought, okay, we need to define what is faith. And, and Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us just a great definition where it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So our beginning point of faith 
is believing in God's character, that he is who he says he is. And sort of our ending point is believing in God's promises, that he will do what he says he will do. So for us as a church and as members of this church, our choice of God, our exercise of faith, challenges us to build lives worthy of him. So in the context of the church, and that's what we're talking about as our church family today, Acts 2 teaches that all believers are to devote themselves to the teaching of the word, to fellowship, sharing of meals, and to prayer. And you'll notice that the emphasis is on all believers, not just pastors, certainly not just elders, but all believers. Then the question becomes, so you've got these three separate parts, and last week we talked about the role of an elder, and I'm happy that we're transitioning and talking about our role together, no longer individuals. But the question is, how do these three separate parts, the pastors, the body, and the elders, work together in bringing glory to God? And in thinking about that, it, it drew me to a chapter in Exodus, and it's Exodus 17. And the scene is a, um, the Israelites are facing an imminent battle with the Amalekites, a barbarous, you know, vicious, uh, nomadic tribe. And the Israelites are greatly outnumbered and fearful, but knowing that they're going to have to engage in battle. And the, the verse says, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand up on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites and, as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Whenever Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up, held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with a sword. To me, that's just a great picture of our roles together, not independent, but interdependent. The, the pastors being held up by the body and by the elders to fulfill God's role for us all. Yeah, it's a great story. You know, you've got Joshua out <clears throat> fighting, you have Aaron and Ur, you know, holding up Moses' hands, and you've got Moses lifting up his hands like it's the symbol of giving praise to God. Um, and he got tired, you know, and whenever there was a lack of prayer, which is we took our month to pray, um, you know, to kind of restart our church in this foundation of prayer. I think it's, it's such a great story of what our family should look like. And, you know, we were talking about the independent parts and the how we need to be a unified body, working all together. And there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 12 that says that now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it an integral part of it. Not that any one of them can um, operate individually or on their own, but we must do it as an interdependent group. Um, Acts 2 also teaches that all believers must engage in generosity, sharing everything they have been given by God. So you have come accustomed to whenever an elder stands up here and starts talking about generosity, you sort of sit back and think, oh my gosh, here it comes again. I promise you that's not what this is. I want to encourage us. But we talk, when we talk about generosity in the church, we're normally led to a discussion of finances of the church. So often this discussion comes with negative connotations. Not today. But we, normally, it's, you know, we say, well, if we just had more money this month, if we could just receive more money and we'll do special offerings, if we could just have more members and then we'd give more money. More, more, more. And we keep saying, God, be our provision. Provide us this, provide us that, provide more and more. And it's time that we all realize that we have been incredibly blessed in this church by the resources that God has entrusted to us. He has sustained us 
every single day for over 30 years. And he will continue to sustain us day by day. And for, I think that we all need, particularly, and the elders will commit to this too, that we need to stop asking God to be our provision by providing more. God has already clearly established he is our provision. And we are now called to be good stewards of his provisions. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, or provides that now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. That is our obligation. That is our role with respect to what God has entrusted to us. And I just want to make sort of a promise to you, a covenant with the body. That is, those who've been given the trust to faithfully steward the resources entrusted to this church, we as the elder board, through continual prayer, humble submission to God's will and seeking his intentions for us, commit to you that we have made and will continue to make adjustments necessary to honor and preserve all that our Father has, got, has amply blessed us with. End of discussion about money. I just want you to understand this is our mutual commitment to each other and to God. Amen. You know, um, I love how uh, the church in Thessalonica was known as a church of works of faith, and they were just busy about it. But Jesus in Revelation 2, he kind of calls out this church, and he says, I know your works. You're doing all of these things, but you lost your first love. So there's a motive behind the work. Um, and Andre, what does it mean to, be, to have labors of love? What is that motivation? Yeah, I love that because I do believe that it's the motivation to all these works of faith we find ourselves doing. You know, Paul also said, I think of the verse where he said, let all you do be done in love. So don't do anything without love. And it reminds me of the so story. I, I'm not giving out of force my time, my talent, or my treasure. Mm -hmm. I've got a motive attached to right. it that's we're not, love. We're not coerced. We're not. It, it wells up within us. Um, the word says, you know, he's poured out his love in our hearts. Mm. And it, it's what motivated Paul. It's what motivates us. But it reminds me of a story that I told our women at our Bible study Tuesday when we were serving on the mission field and we were a part of great works of faith over there. We got to be a part of such a sweet work um, coming in and rescuing these child soldiers, and God did miraculous things. You had to have a work of faith just to leave and live there because it was hard. But, um, you know, living there, and I think what began to happen in my heart was I began to pride myself in all that we were doing for him, all that we were sacrificing, and all that we were giving. And, you know, it was hard. I mean, there was malaria and sickness, and we didn't have running water, and so there was all those things. And as I began to kind of pride myself in all we had sacrificed for the Lord in this work of faith, I was reading 1 Corinthians 13 one day, and he just knocked on my heart because it says there, if you speak in tongues of men and of angels, but you don't have love, you're a noisy gong. And if you have prophetic powers, it says even if your faith is so great you can move mountains, if you don't have love, you're not anything. And it ends with, you could even give all you have away, and you could even deliver up your body to be burned, like literally giving and sacrificing your own life. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. And so he just knocked on my heart and said, you know, you're doing all this, but that little area of bitterness you've got in there, you know, you wouldn't think as a missionary that you'd be bitter, but with all the need that was around us and 40 people coming every day for a cup of rice or just to live, and I'm worried about my kids and how they're going to make it. Um, you know, I, I grew a little bitter. And just that last person that came at the end of the day is like, oh, they just want something. And God just convicted me, but it's not my heart for them. And so asking, okay, Lord, give me your heart because I don't want to do all of this for nothing. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we're asking, we're seeing a dynamic church in Acts chapter 2 that is dynamically offering and exercising their gifts. But we also see they did it with heart. You know, and so the motive of the gift was from love for Jesus, not like some other false motive, right? Yeah, amen. I was thinking too, Paul also said, when he says that verse, Christ's love compels us, um, it's, he says, so that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for their sake. And as I look around at our body, 
his bride, this church, as Melissa said, I think of a couple people, and it spurs me on. You know, also the word says, spur one another on toward love and good works. And what spurs me on is when I see people like Bob, Bob in his 90s, that could very easily sit and wait for everyone to attend to his need. But Bob is here faithfully every Sunday, early at 9 a.m. for prayer, and he stands back by that door and greets everybody that comes through that back right door. That's the door I go through just so I can see Bob and the kiss on his cheek. <laughs> yeah, I don't know of another church where you walk in and there's a 90-year-old man with big lips on his cheek, and I'd like you to know that Melissa is the deliverer of those lips <laughs> on his cheek. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you know, I just always love to ask Bob, Bob, what are you thinking? What are you, you know, at that age, you're like, something you tell me is going to be worth something. And always, Bob gives this comment, there's no greater joy than serving the Lord. And he has found the truth of just joy in honest service that comes out of his heart. But also, from the oldest to even our youngest, I was thinking of Courtney Rodriguez. She's a senior here. And spurred on, burdened, this welled up in her own heart, just a heart to want to learn sign language and deliver hope and help to kids who are deaf. God opens up an avenue. She finds a ministry in Uganda um, through a ministry, DCH, Deaf Child Hope. And so she coordinates our trip coming up in July to Uganda, July 11th. And so now we've got a trip going out from our church, and that was coordinated by a senior in high school here. And so God will use the 90-year-old. <laughs> Amen. And he'll use the teenager, and he moves by his spirit in our hearts, and it's beautiful to see. And then I get spurred on as we look at one another doing these works of faith and labors of love, spurred on by our love in our hearts for the Lord. We spur one another on in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, the last two Fridays, um, Andre and I have had the privilege to do Pastor's Perspective on uh, Friday at 3 o'clock, um, and Andre's been hitting some really home runs spiritually. Um, home run. <laughs> but I got a text message from one of the board members of, you know, of uh, Pastor Perspective, and he asked if Andrea could be on daily. Um, and I said, what about me? And the text message was, can Andrea be on daily again? <laughs> so I just thought it was great. But you know, works of faith, labors of love um, are sometimes difficult. And sometimes there, it's hard to love, and it's hard to go to Uganda, it's hard to go to Malawi, um, it's hard to sometimes be Blake and wear headphones that keep falling off. You know, the serving sometimes needs a lot of endurance. And Melissa, um, you find yourself in a different season of life, and God has placed you in a, a place where um, this next testimony of the church is really something that you're holding on to, this endurance of hope. You've given your life to Jesus. Um, you have faithfully worked, invested into countless marriages here as a marriage mentor, um, investing into my daughter. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed. Um, but yet you're in this different season. How have you defined this endurance of hope in your life? So, um I'm not usually nervous ever, and my heart is pounding out of my chest. Um, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer on February 4th, 2017, and I don't have just a little cancer like on my shoulder. It's in my lungs, liver, and spine. So to get a diagnosis like that is daunting. And for my husband, um, probably pretty scary. And um, I could see, you know, that he was angry as well. But I don't think I'm the only one sitting up here talking about my cancer. I think there are people in this body that have their own cancer, whatever your challenge is, whatever you're going through. And I've had the profound privilege of having the body of this church come around us and be the hands and feet of Christ and to love us and to show mercy and compassion and give us hope. And I think of always Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So I thought when I got this diagnosis, okay, Lord, I wasn't mad and I wasn't scared, but I was sad because I was afraid I, would, I wouldn't get to experience some things that were my heart's desire. 
And at the time, my daughter-in-law was expecting twins, and I prayed I'd get to meet those little twins. They were due in four months. And, um, you know, my son Hunter, he's not married yet, and I pray I'll get to dance at his wedding. And so there are all these things that I went to the Lord and said, Lord, I really want those things to happen. And, of course, he blessed us, and I got to meet those beautiful little twins who are now eight months old and are perfect, I might mention. <laughs> um, and I have two other grandchildren that are equally perfect. But anyway, that was a, a giant blessing. But what I really want to make sure I get across is that God is in this room and in this body. And when I needed him most and I cried out to him, he delivered every single time before I even knew it many times. I'm going to have to talk about a couple people in the body just so that I can get the, my point across, but the pastors and the staff of this church came alongside of us and blessed us in a mighty way. Uh, Chet and Andrea prayed with us the first night we told them we had cancer, and I have a live verse that Chet, the Lord just placed that on Chet's heart, and that great, gave me great comfort that... Uh, my life verse is, for he who began a good work will be faithful until the completion. And Chet said that verse to me that night. Now, out of all the verses in the Bible, how did he know that? How would he know that? That was a Jesus kiss. Mm. That was my Lord and Savior giving me comfort in a difficult time. I also want to talk about our small growth group. And I see people here from that small growth group, Bill Shedd and Jill Shedd. Bill, you've been an amazing support to my husband. You have loved him and been a place where he feels safe, where he can talk about maybe his fears or the things that he's anxious about. So I love you guys for that. I see Kim Johnson, Dana and Steve Lorenz. I know Bob and Don Wolfsberger are probably holding up the back wall there by the sound booth. I see you. Those are good people. Those are Jesus kisses. We meet every Tuesday night at John and Lori Gash's house. And I am surrounded by people who love me, love my family, and lift me up. That's the body of this church. I have tea once a month with my dearest friend, Sherry Whirl, who I came to know the Lord through. Sherry Whirl is the reason why I know and serve our mighty King. I think of Carolyn David Fish, who brought my husband to the Lord, sitting right out there, faithful, giving giving love and, and support to anybody they run into. I think of the women's Bible study. I never got to do a Bible study before at the church. I, I was an executive climbing the corporate ladder. That was really important. Didn't have time for that. But God made time for that. And I get the profound privilege of sitting with about 15 young ladies. I'm kind of the old lady in the group. I'm grateful that Jen Brown asked me to be in this group because these women are all raising their children and I get the profound privilege of praying with them and being with them in God's word. And then there is my mighty warrior group, John Burke. Your wife, Christine, is amazing. And I get the profound privilege of standing shoulder to shoulder with her as we fight this beast. And she's remarkable. And Kim and Doug, thank you for introducing me to her. These little pieces, these little parts of our body are Jesus right here giving us kisses, holding us up, encouraging us, giving us hope, surrounding us with mercy and compassion. I don't know what the future holds, but I've never had a more joyful season. I can't believe I can say joy has surrounded me in this time. I see John and Kat Elliott. Thank you. They are faithful servants for this church, and they have a heart and mercy. And um, I get a card from them just about every week of encouragement, and I'm grateful for you. So the body, you, are the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I get to firsthand be washed in that love on a daily, weekly, hourly basis. And I'm grateful and privileged to be part of this body and to have all of you be part of our journey. Amen. That's the church. Works of faith, labor of love, 
and endurance of hope. And each one of us make up the church. I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. What are we, we don't want a bunch of eyeballs rolling down into the seats. Foot can't say to the head, I'm good. It wouldn't know where to go. And each one of us have been given gifts. And our prayer over the course of this year is that you'll figure out how am I a part of this body? Because we want to set an example to be a beacon on a hill, not for the sake of being the best church. There's great churches all around us. We have a job to do, to seek and save the lost, to disciple. It's a simple job, and we want to do it well. And every person that you heard mentioned, they're just a part of the church. There's no special person. What I love is Sherry Worrell leading Melissa to Christ. And now, in a different season of her life, wanting to invest and engage, going to be teaching our interns, going to be discipling our body through a devotional. The ministry just continues. I love Carol mentioned such a support for Doug here every Monday, serving, making sure that your kids are ministered to. This is our church, not my church. This is the church of Jesus. And he fills every single one of us. And we have a responsibility not to do church our way, to do it his way, so that he is glorified the way that he has determined that he is glorified. And this couple, along with seven other incredible couples, want to lead our church as the elders of this church into a role and a realm where we're glorifying God together. Amen? Amen. Amen. We love you guys. And I'm speaking for the elders. We love you. When you see us in the store, you're not a bother. When you see us at CVS, don't start with, I don't mean to bother you. We want you to bother us. We're not too busy. We're your shepherds. We love you. We just want to do church God's way. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Melissa, would you like to do your solo now? <laughs> That's all you get for now. <laughs> I love her. Hey, I'd like to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this church. And I pray that as we come together and just have a family talk, that this church would be known for its works of faith, labors of love, and endurance of hope. And Lord, with my hands stretched out, I pray that prayer of blessing on our church, that we would be a family, not strangers, that we wouldn't be fine with, hello, how are you? But we would know each other. That we would reach out to each other. That the world would look on and go, I want a part of that. And I pray that this church that's set on this hill would be like a city on a hill. And the people would be attracted to you because of the flavor that they taste here at Coast Hills. So I pray that blessing on us and ask in the name of Jesus that the word that Doug gave, that we'd go out and fight our battle, that our Joshuas, our interns, our young people would be out in that battlefield and that our Aaron's and our Ur's and our Moses's would be praying and have set such an incredible godly example I pray for more Courtney's and Sherry's. I pray for more life groups and investments and engagements 
where we are pouring into each other's lives, being the church. I pray for our elders. Thank you for them. Because they come as a pair, husband and wife, with their families. And as they face attack, <laughs> opinions, and all kinds of things, I pray that we would be known for our care, our counsel, and our character. Give us this grace. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for great grace. I pray for great power. And I pray for great fear over this church. That we would do church your way and we'd know how to conduct ourselves in it. We are your church. We are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you. Our response is not because we have to. Because you went to the cross willingly. We give our lives willingly. In the great name of Jesus, we all say, Amen. You are, you are, you are my freedom.